Hello and welcome to Business Incorporated Live on Channel Television. Here's what's coming up in the next 55 minutes. Zimbabwe's new currency, the ZIG, strengthens a day after its debut. And the World Bank says Nigeria's 2024 inflation rate will drop to 24.8%. It's a record high for the eighth session in a row. Great to have you join us. I'm Ladi Williams. Well, it's a public holiday right here in Nigeria, but we're still tracking um, all the markets uh, open for trade uh, around the world. Let's get a check on the oil market now. We we'll see U.S. crude oil future, uh, futures. At, at that fell um, today after Israel reduced its true presence in Gaza. And we see that um, after uh, losing that $90 level. That's for Brent. We see it's back at $90.52 um, a barrel, 0.10% um, jump. And uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, crude version there, um, $86.53 a barrel, marginal rise. Uh, from earlier trade today, 0.03%. Uh, we see um, uh, most of other the contracts uh, deliverable. We see some drops uh, in most of those um, contracts, but we see Israel uh, withdrew forces from the southern Gaza uh, city of uh, Khan Yunis uh, over the weekend, bringing its uh, troop levels um, in the region uh, much uh, lower. And we see the oil market actually responding to that um, at this time. All right, let's get a check on the metals market. Now we see gold there hits a record high uh, for the eighth consecutive session um, today. And we see U.S. Uh, gold futures 1.20% up. And uh, we see gold sitting comfortably above that $2,300 level. Spot silver is also up. Um, bigger move, one34 uh, percent, $28.18 per ounce. Palladium, um, that's up 1.76 percent, priced at uh, $1,069. And we see um, investors still waiting for um, policy um, guidance. Uh, that's from the U.S. What's going to happen next? This is going to be uh, when they're going to get that rate cut for the first time um, this year. But we're seeing gold doing very well uh, right now. To so some company news now, one of Nigeria's oldest and largest banks, that's um, UBA Nigeria, released its audited accounts for the 2023 financial year, which shows an impressive performance uh, from a year earlier. Um, key highlights of the results sent to the Nigerian Exchange Limited reveals that the bank, uh, the group gross earnings surged more than 139% to 2 trillion naira, while interest income um, jumped by 93%, while its uh, net interest income rose by 86%. At the same time, the group's pre-tax profit uh, soared by 277% year on year, after tax profit was significantly higher by 257%, while the group's earnings per share I recorded a 264% jump uh, for the previous, before the, uh, the previous year's uh, figure. Uh, still with bank earnings, one of the country's largest banks, Zenit Bank, has also released its audited accounts for the fiscal year uh, 2023 with a growth of 125.4% in gross earnings and 2.13 uh, trillion naira. Further highlights of the financial results shows that the banks reported a net interest income of approximately 736 billion naira, which is more than double what was reported in the previous year. At the same time, the bank's pre-tax profit increased by 179% at 795 billion naira after tax profits soared by more than 200%, while its earnings per share um, skyrocketed by 201%. Meanwhile, Zenit Bank's board has approved a dividend of three naira 50 koba per share for the 2023 financial year. And right from the bank earnings now, we report of traders along the Nigeria-Niger borders rejecting the Naira due to its depreciation in value. The need for aggressive measures to boost its value has become more necessary. Uh, for the lead uh, consultant and CEO of 3T Impacts Trade Academy, Dr. Bamidili uh, Ayemibo, this time is he's saying that right now is to increase non-oil production and export uh, both to African countries and beyond. It was a guest earlier on Business Morning. Take a listen. 
looking at a place people want to invest because of Treasury Bill and a number of other government uh, instruments. So now investment is coming in, so FX is flowing in, rate is coming down. But it's not sustainable. We now must generate Forex ourselves because those money that are coming are going to go out at some point. So what is happening at the border is to let us know that, look, even our neighbor are rejoining our currency because our value is going down. So we must grow non oil export. I think that's what we should be having conversation around now. Having, I mean, to a large extent, CBN is doing a lot. There seems to be a synergy between the fiscal policy and the monetary policy to stabilize the economy. But now, can we begin to now take non oil export growth very more seriously? Because I'm not seeing a lot of that in the effort being made by the government, both on the fiscal side and monetary side. What CBN is trying to do is, in all, almost all the intervention, that the last administration went into, CBN said, look, that's not our job. And the reason why, why CBN went into it before, because of the, the fiscal side, we're not doing enough. But I think it would have been good for CBN to work with them at that time to be able to get them to do what they need to do. So, for example, you feel there's a need for intervention in a particular sector, why don't you support the ministry in question to be able to achieve that? That's exactly what I think we should be, we should be looking at. But now we're not seeing that in terms of, like you said, non oil export. So for example, I'm expecting by now, we should be hearing the president talk a lot about non oil export, the minister of trade, minister of finance, saying a lot about non oil export trade. We're not hearing this, I mean, statement that shows that this is what the government wants to do. Let me give you an example. So we have ambassadors around the world. Our ambassadors should have a target, like ambassador in Nigeria have. We have had a situation where we had uh, we do some program with some, with the National Banking and Finance, American Experience Studies, and we, on trade. And we see ambas uh, embassies sending their staff, Nigerians, to come and train to be able to develop Nigerian market for those countries abroad. All right, and still talking about the Naira at this time, we've seen the central bank has issued, uh, did issue a circular to BDC operators, informing them of a new uh, amount they're going to be selling. That's a new price uh, for the dollar, 1,101 Naira. So we've seen a lot of moves by the central bank um, in the market to defend you know, Naira. So it's come a long way from about 1,800 uh, Naira to dollar. And we're here now at the official window, and it might even get cheaper at the uh, parallel market. Let's join us now is uh, Charlie Robertson, head of macro strategy, uh, FIM Partners, uh, joining me via Zoom. Great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me back. I appreciate it. Fantastic. So how do you see the, the recent moves by the CBN, you know, to defend the Naira? We've seen a big um, appreciation there from about 1,008 to um, this levels. We're seeing now about 1,200 Naira to the dollar. It, it got ridiculously cheap. Um, I, was, I was explaining about a month or so ago that it was the cheapest currency in the world, um, on a par with Japan, by the way. But Japan's got all of its own issues. Um, and, and is desperately trying to keep it super cheap. So 40% cheap on my model, uh, that, that's not normal. And, and the central bank knows that the currency is so important for kind of anchoring inflation expectations that if you're, you know, if you're selling tomatoes, you might be thinking what price should I be selling tomatoes at based on the dollar naira rate. So they understand that getting a, a, a more realistic value for the naira, and I think it is getting more realistic now, um, was, was a good idea, a uh, good idea to get inflation down, a good idea to restore business confidence. Um, they just didn't have the means to do it until a few months ago. Right. Uh, and, and looking at this price um, right now, would you say the Naira is still heavily undervalued at this price? It, it's still the second cheapest in Africa after Egypt. Um, so, and, and Egypt's like 30% cheap. Naira is about 27% cheap to, to a kind of a long-term average of what the Naira has been in, in today's money. So, I, yeah, it still does look cheap. I mean, fair value. Fair value is not, not a great concept, but the average rate in today's money of the Naira, stripping out the impact of inflation, has been about 900 to the dollar over the last 25 years. So, 1,200, 1,300 was still cheap. Right. All right. Uh, I paint a picture of what you think it's, you know, costing the CBN, that's the central bank, um, to keep the Naira, you know, strengthening from those uh, really low levels. We've already seen reserves drop about a billion dollars. This is the 30-day rolling average reserves. So it's, it could be more than that, of course, uh, a bit more than that. So they, they're definitely pumping in a chunk of money. Um, to some extent, they should. I mean, they, where, where, when the dollars come into Nigeria but particularly through the oil trade, which is the biggest export earner for the countries you know, the central bank 
gets those dollars. So if anyone's going to supply dollars, it's going to come via the central bank. So there's an element of saying, okay, we're making this on exports. Let's let's deliver some of this uh, dollars to the market so that anyone in Nigeria can can get access to them. So yes, they're spending it. Yeah, I'd be more comfortable if the reserves were rising or at least stable. Um, so it's a bit concerning that they're down this much. Right, and and talking about that uh, fair value of about 900 naira to the dollar, um, what do you think it will cost the central bank to actually get it to that level? And is this um, sustainable, the interventions we're seeing from the central bank at this time? I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't aim for fair. I wouldn't aim to keep it at the average. Um, so, so the work I did in the time traveling economist that came out a couple of years ago was was showing that countries with small banking systems, and and if you look at bank deposits in Nigeria to GDP, it's about 20, 25 percent. So that's quite small. Countries with small deposits tend to have high interest rates, and those high interest rates slow growth and hurt the economy. Um, so. The way to, to resolve that, or one way to, to offset that and to reduce those interest rates is to run a current account surplus and export more than you're importing. And obviously, it helps to have a cheap currency to do that. So, if I was advising the central bank, I'd be saying, aim for it to be 10 to 20% cheap, 1,000 to the dollar, maybe 1,100 to the dollar. That, that would be an appropriate measure. And the current account will be in surplus then, probably, should be. And, and as a result, Reserves can then be picking up, and that improves credit worthiness of Nigeria and then the way the rating agencies look at Nigeria. So you start to get credit rating upgrades, uh, a sustainable currency level. Uh, I think it's a decent combination. Right. Uh, talking about the, the BDCs, uh, we see the central bank selling um, dollars to them, about $10,000 each at about 1,101 naira to the dollar. That was the latest um, announcement. So that's going to roll in um, very soon. But do you think the, the BDC operators are satisfied you know, with the intervention by the CBN at this time? I suspect what the CBN is trying to do via the BDCs is to get popular buy-in to try and get everybody in Nigeria to recognize that that time of extreme weakness in the Naira is over. Um, and and they are, they're using the BDCs um, to, to help push the parallel rate stronger and, and using that to then pull the official rate uh, stronger too. So I, I think the BDCs are a pretty important part of the story, which is, which is quite encouraging because it's allowing, it's allowing kind of the private sector to be playing some role um, at the same time as the central banks obviously playing a very significant role. And, and talking about, you know, the private sector, we, we did, um, I'm sure you've been following the story about uh, Binance. Um, they did clamp down, the, the government did clamp down on their uh, P2P trades. That's, uh, they, they're trading the um, USDT, that's a stable coin, and they've been accused of, you know, speculation and, you know, manipulating the Naira. And ever since, you know, uh, Binance, uh, P2P exchange got to uh, clamp down on it. Uh, we've seen the Naira actually strengthen. So do you think um, these crypto exchanges really do um, play against the currency of a country? I, I w don't know enough to, to, to opine on that specifically. All we do know is that when MFL did his currency restrictions, Bitcoin in general, crypto became a very popular way for people to move money in and out of Nigeria. Um, and, and the difficulty with that is that when it stays in Bitcoin, it's not sitting in bank accounts in, in Naira, which gets lent out to the real economy, or, or in dollars, which potentially gets lent out to the real economy. It's, it's just kind of out of the economic system. So it's not helping. It doesn't help on investment. It doesn't help on, on growth. So I don't think it's been helpful for Nigeria as a, as a country, while it has been helpful to protect people's savings at a time when they couldn't get move their money at a, at a sensible exchange rate. So I, I think the story's changed now. I think what the central bank's saying is that you can now trust the currency, you can be involved, you don't have to be using Bitcoin, and in fact, you shouldn't be, and, and the accusations against Binance, perhaps a part of that. But uh, it's... Uh, I don't, I don't think it's in itself the biggest story. I think the biggest story is the central bank cleared the official arrears it was prepared to accept and could then use the current account surplus that we're seeing each month to start intervening in the FX market to enable the, the, the currency to rally. I think these were more important. 
Right, and, and we see the Naira is actually, uh, has been rallying at the official window. Do you see any key resistance um, levels for the Naira? No, I don't. Um, and I do tend to look at these kind of trend lines, resistance levels and so on. I, I, I don't see that. I think the volatility has been so big in this last, uh, in the last few months that they don't mean very much. Right, so at, at this point, we don't see any resistance uh, levels uh, for the um, Naira strengthening. But um, we, we did see the, cent the, the World Bank you know, saying, forecasting um, that Nigeria's inflation will fall to about 24% in 2024. Um, how, how are you seeing this um, forecast? It, it, sounds, it sounds plausible. Um, what, the difficulty here, and the IMF just did a paper on this about a month ago, is that when currencies sell off, they did a, a research paper on sub-Saharan currencies, and when currencies sell off, they really feed through into, into inflation. So as the currency is weakening, you see inflation picking up. When the currency strengthens back again, it has almost no beneficial impact. It, it looks like people will, people who are selling imported goods raise the price you know, when the currency is weakening off, but when the, the currency is strengthening, they take the profits. They don't deliver the price cuts that they could um, on, on the items they're selling locally. So it's going to take a while to get inflation down. And I think the World Bank figure of, of 20, 24% fits with that. Because actually, if you've got the currency going from 1600 to 1200 you should be expecting prices to be dropping by a quarter. But, but that's not happening, I doubt. And we will see when the inflation figures come out. So it takes a while, but next year's numbers, you know, Double digit maybe, but but somewhere to ten to fifteen percent, twenty twenty five. That would be very interesting to see and very encouraging. Yeah, definitely very encouraging. Seeing um, food inflation already uh, way over uh, thirty five uh, percent at this time. But but seeing the wins with uh, with the naira um, at this time, with the interventions we've seen from the central bank, is it easier to uh, control currency devaluation uh, than taming inflation from what we've seen in Nigeria? I think that, uh, yeah, it's going to be quicker, <laughs> definitely much quicker to, to stabilize the currency to get inflation down. Um, is it easier? I think they're, just, they're related to the same thing. That, that point I was making earlier about bank deposits being quite low, it also means that bank lending is quite low. So in the West, people are up to here in debt from mortgages and consumer credit cards and all the rest. Um, that's much less of a story um, in in. A lot of frontier economies, actually. So, as a result, you move interest rates. A lot of people don't have a big loan that they're impacted by. It doesn't have that same slowing down effect on demand and therefore on inflation in a country like Nigeria. So, the exchange rate becomes probably the most important way to get inflation under control. And when you've lost control of the currency, then you've also lost control of inflation. But that's the central bank's getting control back, I think, on both at the moment. All right. I know you're the you know you're the traveling you know economist. So I want you to travel and see what's uh, coming you know for the end of 2024 for Nigeria. Do you see uh, some kind of soft landing or no landing for the economy, or hard landing? The difficulty there is I think the second most difficult thing to forecast is the oil price in the world, and uh, and that's doing quite well uh, in the last two months. I think it's telling us that the world economy is is getting a little bit healthier. Um, and if we can keep oil at around $90 or so through the course of the year, and that's going to be quite supportive of Nigeria getting its, say, 3% growth. The trouble is that 3% growth is not, not what we want to see in Nigeria, right? We've got population growth running at 3%. So in real terms, per capita terms, people are not getting better off at 3%. Um, what we want to do is see, see that picking up to 4 or 5%. For that, we need better investment numbers. Um, stable currency helps. Um, so I, th I think the, the bigger question is, we go into 2025, assuming the West has avoided a recession, if oil can stay around $90, interest rates have come down, is that when we, there's got to be a decent chance that Nigeria starts to look like a, a stronger 4% growth, or even better maybe in 2025. All right, definitely we're looking out for it. Thank you so much. Always great having your perspective. Uh, Charlie Robertson, head of macro strategy at Firm Partners. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll take a break now. Uh, when we come back, we head straight to the markets uh, with Anita Edda. That's the moment. Just stay with us.
back. Well, let's head straight to the markets now. We know it's a public holiday here, so the local bosses are closed right here in Nigeria. But other markets uh, are open, and we have an to edit um, uh, with the details on uh, what's playing out in most of the global markets we track. Yes. Great to have you, yes, and a happy holidays. Back. Yeah, we're here back again. Um, for, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, financial markets in Nigeria will be closed for three days. Wow, but that's, that's not the biggest, time. because in Bangladesh, they're, they're, they're going to be closed for about five days. Wow. So they will be resuming um, trading. That's both the banks and the financial markets will be open in Bangladesh uh, on Monday next week. So it's not just Nigeria that is, 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 is that why we Is that why we saw the, the NGX actually down for last week? Maybe they were expecting, you know, the holidays are going to be long mm. and some just had to take profit off the table exactly. so that they could spend. Of course, uh, that's, that's not far-fetched. Of course, we also mentioned that at some point, you know, people are also taking positions, position for um, Q1 results, which will right. be released. And then, of course, some people are also reacting to the um, the the, uh, the recent directive by the Central Bank of Nigeria calling for a recapitalization the of big uh, recap. the bank, of course, and that has been taking toll on the on the banking counter. Uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that in, in the course of the week right. with uh, one of our market analysts. But first, let's talk about uh, Monday's trading session because it's a holiday. Take a look at the board there. Nigeria stock market as at Monday, 0.238%. In the red, still in the red, marking about the fourth consecutive day for starting from last week where we started the month. And of course, an additional 220.81 billionaire wiped off from the market's total value. So, but in terms of the other markets, South Africa's stock exchange, the JSC, was the loan, uh, the loan index trading for today uh, with a 0.46% increase as at intraday. For the other side of the market, the Egyptian stock exchange, as well as the, the, uh, the Kenya stock market, they were also closed. This is for Monday for Kenya stock exchange, 2.08% in the red and dropping from the previous figure, while the Egyptian stock exchange is up 1.25% as at Monday. And now we talk about, this time we talk about the, the fixed income market. Uh, we we normally do not have this, but since it's a holiday, we might as well talk about the fixed income market in, in broader perspective. For the treasury bills market, we saw that um, it was a bullish sentiment there uh, from on, for the for the NTB. We're supposed to have the NTB the the. the, the NTB auction, a primary market auction this week, but now it's been moved from Wednesday to Friday because of the extended uh, holiday. But this is for Monday's closing, where we saw a total value of 25.85 billion are being uh, churned out there in 21 deals. And across the board, where you can see the highest concentration was on the 27th of March, 2025 paper with nine deals at about nine billion. Are. For the other side of the market, the bonds market, we also see some bullish sentiment there. Average yield there had declined by two basis points to 19.2%. But this is what you have on your board there. The 21st of February 2034 paper with a price of 96 Naira. And then having the highest number of deals there, 17 deals, worth about 920.6 billion Naira. Then across the board, you can see all the other, the 20 the 20th of March paper, the 21st of March, 2038, uh, all culminating to a total of 40 deals. We had some others, but these are the top four that we could pick out uh, for, for, your, for our board there and for our consumption at about uh, 60.9 billion Naira. Now, let's talk about the yesterday's directive by the central bank, which has been coming out very, very active. And this time, the central bank has banned the use of dollar-denominated uh, collaterals for obtaining Naira loans except under specific conditions. Now, to give, give us a better understanding of this, let's talk to Demola Oshuntoki, a fixed income dealer at Access Bank for more details on this. Thank you for joining us, Demola. Good morning, Anita. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, good afternoon, rather. Uh, okay. Thank you for having me. Okay. Now, before we get to that, um, uh, what I, I, I introduced to you, uh, can you just give us a better understanding of uh, the trading of uh, fixed income at the fixed income markets on Monday? Yeah, so what we've seen is we saw a bit of cautious uh, sentiment within the market. And the reason being, you know, we were all anticipating the NTB auction, which was meant to take place on Wednesday. Uh, given the holidays, this is now going to take place on Friday. And then the settlement as well will be on Friday. There's about 149 billion that's going to be offered across the standard maturity. So that's the 91, the 182, as well as the 364. So largely the expectation is we'll continue to see the trend of uh, more attractive rates. Uh, we've seen the DMOB proactive in terms of offering these at about 
21% level. So I'm expecting that to be maintained. In regards to market liquidity, there's about 49 billion uh, currently. So uh, I'm not sure if there'll be enough liquidity to oversell, but what I do expect is they will maintain those stop rates at 21%, which is about 27% yield, which is a good return for investors. Mm. And also to add on to that, we know that there's also the bond auction that's going to take place on Monday, where there's about 600 billion that's going to be offered. Mm. Okay, so that's for the fixed income side of the market. So now let's talk in broader perspective about the, uh, the, the recent uh, circular release by the central bank, you know, banning the use of dollar, the denominated collateral. Now, now give us a better understanding of this for, those, uh, for most of us who do not really know what this implies. So what we can see is we can see that the CBN governor has been very consistent. And I use the word consistent in terms of there's been a lot of consistency in terms of his approach to the market. What essentially this is going to do is provide a lot more liquidity within the market. So essentially what it is is any uh, loans that were backed by dollars, uh, you'd have to essentially sell those dollars uh, to essentially get Naira. And the reason he's doing this is to provide more liquidity within the market. We, if we look at it from January to date, we can see that the governor has been true to his word in a number of interventions that have been uh, drive towards providing more liquidity within the market. If we walk back a little bit, we remember when uh, he said banks could only hold a, sh a square position or a short position by 25% of shareholder funds. And that meant that overnight, uh, any banks that were long in terms of dollars had to sell uh, essentially those positions to provide more liquidity within the market. Now, what this is going to do is provide uh, essentially even more liquidity within the market. And there's some harsh penalties for any banks that are not in this position. So there's two exceptions to this rule, essentially, which is if you are using those dollars to secure, for example, uh, Nigerian euro, sovereign euro bonds, then exemplary you'll be exempt for this rule. Or aside from if you have, if you're backed by LCs uh, from foreign counterparties, then you'll be exempt for this rule. But other than that, banks have 90 days to essentially um, work around to, uh, resolve any any of these loans that are cashed back by dollars so essentially all that dollar liquidity what we're going to see within the next couple of uh, within the next couple of months is we'll see those we'll see that our, our FX number slightly elevated which would also help uh, what we're seeing within the NAPEX you know within the NAPEX we've seen in a steady appreciation uh, at the start of March we're at about 1,500 levels now we're at about 1,200 and what this is going to do it's going to uh, additionally provide uh, more liquidity within the market, which is going to further reduce uh, that NAPEX rate. So if we're lucky, we could even see this drop down to 1,100 or 1,000 uh, levels. Mm. Okay, so now that takes me to uh, my final question for you, which is just in 60 seconds. On Monday, the uh, National Bureau of Statistics will release the March inflation numbers. Already, we're currently at 31.7%, and projections are that it would climb to about 32%. So now, what is your expectation for this, and what are the implications for the, for the, for the, for the financial market, particularly the fixed income markets? So for March figures, what I'm expecting to see is we'd either see a, a slight decline or we'd either see it remain at the same levels. And the reason I say that is because the key reason for our high inflation numbers is food inflation. You know, food inflation, which was about 35%, I think the last time that they released the numbers, as well as a lot of insecurity. And there's only so much that monetary policies can do in terms of helping to stem this inflation. So uh, what we're expecting to see in the next coming months is we're expecting to see probably more... Um, innovative and incentives from the fiscal side in terms of helping to curb this inflation, which would help to reduce uh, food uh, prices significantly, as well as if we can resolve our insecurity problems, then that helps us in getting more farmers uh, on, on the farms. You know, it helps if we also have intervention in terms of reducing uh, transportation costs, that would further help in terms of uh, reducing these uh, reducing these prices uh, significantly. Mm. Um, so within the next, uh, when, when this comes out, what I'm expecting to see is either we will maintain at 31% or we could drop maybe slightly to 30%. So nothing too significant is what I'm expecting. Mm. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep our expectations for that um, as we, uh, as we uh, climb into another week. So thank you so much, uh, Demola Oshuntoki, fixed income dealer right. at Access Bank. Okay, so now let's go to the Middle East where we see the major indexes yeah, uh, across in Nigeria here as well as major parts of the Middle Eastern side region. Many of the markets there 
are closed. These are the closing, the, the last close for the Abu Dhabi as well as the, the Dubai, both on the United Arab Emirates. They were in the red, still maintaining that um, since um, on the 5th of April. So this figure has just been in the red, lackluster, no movement, no positive movement there. Now, but for the other side, where we see the Saudi stock exchange, it ended Monday in the green, 0.66%. Uh, what a way to close the, for, for the holiday, while the Qatari stock exchange also in the green, 0.14%. So for the U.S. market, where we see stock futures, there were mostly little change, but coming out from the negative session that we, we, that we had on Monday, the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average still in the red, well, as I said earlier today, uh, while the S&P 500 also in the red, the Nasdaq had a bit of a reprieve. Uh, it, it was also the one that closed in the, in, in the green territory. Now, for Tuesday, we will be expecting that some, uh, some, some, the National Federation of Independent Business will issue its small business survey later today, while all eyes also on the Federal Reserve's minutes from, from, the, from the March meeting, as well as the release of the Consumer Price Index from the world's biggest economy. So that's, right. uh, that's what uh, we're to expect for today and tomorrow from the world's biggest economy, Ladi. Yeah, and it's quite interesting, um, Demola saying that it doesn't expect uh, much of a big change you know, mm. for uh, the inflation um, numbers. Uh, that's for March. And um, definitely with uh, food inflation at about 37%. Uh, mm. percent, uh, Pretty high. And we see you know, the, the global economy is there, like the US, the UK, Trying to almost get into their inflation targets, uh, most mm. of those central bankers. Yeah, meet, meeting inflation targets. Yeah, and I, I can't wait for to start reporting, you know, inflation actually dropping in Nigeria. Mm. But it, did, it does seem like a, a tall task at this point. But um, with the gains we're seeing with the Naira, hopefully, mm. you know, we'll see that play into, you know, the inflation as well as, numbers. As well as the food. Going actually, forward. the major driver, like he mentioned, the major driver of inflation in Nigeria and uh, maybe in other parts of the world, is food. Once right. you can tackle food. that, yes, that possibility, let's not forget that the central bank is targeting a reduction of inflation to about 21%. It might be a tall order, but right. okay, if we can get this right, maybe it will not be a mirage, but a reality. And some say with the amount of arable land we have, we have mm. no business with food inflation mm. you know, being so high right now. But thank you so much, Pleasure. Uh, Nato, for the details there. Most of the markets um, that we track that are still open. But let's take it on to London now. Juliana joins us from our London uh, studio, and we have some data out in the, in the UK. We see our retail sales have improved in March. More good news for the UK economy. Good afternoon, Laddie. That's absolutely right. We have had data this morning from the British Retail Consortium having a forensic look at consumer spending across this country last month, and it's pretty good. It's up 3.5% percent year on year. And I think this is mostly driven um, down to an early Easter. Um, Easter was much earlier than it typically is. And of course, lots of Brits were shopping. So no surprises when you kind of scratch beneath the surface, you can see that food sales were up 6.9 percent year on year. Also, lots of uh, families were hosting friends and, um, you know, family. And uh, yeah, that also increased in terms of cookware and tableware. Also at this time of the year when it gets a bit brighter, although you wouldn't think that looking out of the studio window now, it's very cold and gloomy in the UK. But typically around this year, lots of consumers tend to purchase soft furnishings, which have also done really well in the British Retail Consortium indicator. So it does appear as if perhaps consumer confidence in the UK is back, although we know it ebbs and flows every single month we talk about this data. I think, you know, the, the, the consensus is that perhaps people are now willing to make those extra purchases and those extra spending, particularly as we come into the summer months. Lots of people are going to be outside hosting really big celebrations in the garden. So, yeah, really uh, good news ahead of that GDP day per coming on Friday. And we also see a banking giant, uh, HSBC, they're looking to sell their business in um, Argentina. They might take a, a hit, about $1 billion hit in uh, pre-tax uh, loss. What are you hearing about this? Yeah, it's a really interesting story, actually, especially for HSBC, which we know is Europe's uh, largest lender by market share. It is a UK-based lender, but we know its origins are firmly in Asia, most particularly in Hong Kong. And they have actually got quite a substantial business in Argentina. They own um, more than 100 branches there. They've also got over 3,000 staff. But the Argentinian economy has been an absolute shambles 
over the past couple of months. I was just hearing you speaking to Anyete there, Laddie, about inflation in Nigeria, which I know is too high. But um, looking at the inflation data from Argentina, um, and this isn't a mistake, I read it down, 267% is um, their latest inflation data for February year on year, 267%. The peso has lost more than 50% of its value in the last 12 months alone. And for Noel Quinn, who's the HSBC boss, he's just said, you know, it's just completely unaffordable. I believe um, in the last quarter, they banked losses of about half a, mil- half a billion US dollars. Um, and they're just not going to be doing that um, anymore, which is why they've made the announcement this morning that they're pulling out of Argentina. They're actually going to be selling their business, including the intellectual property and all of the units they have to a local based, I think it's a Buenos Aires based uh, financier. So it's going to take quite a while. I don't think they're going to be completely out of um, the business uh, for at least 12 months. But, uh, you know, their shares rose as soon as that announcement was made because I think their investors realised that perhaps um, the Latin American market is just not for HSBC. Wow, uh, quite incredible seeing inflation rate about 200%. I wonder what that feels like, but I know what 30% feels like, and it's uh, quite uh, grueling, you know, I must say. But we're seeing the sterling... 3%, 3% <laughs> is too much in the UK. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we're seeing the sterling is, is close relative, to about two-week uh, lows at this time. But how are the markets uh, playing out today? I know there's no public holiday right there. It's not a public holiday in the UK. It won't be this week, although, of course, we are celebrating with our Muslim brothers and sisters. Um, GDP data is coming out on Friday. That is, of course, getting investors um, a little bit nervous. As you said, sterling is almost at a two-week low, but coming off the back of months and months of highs against the euro and the US dollar. A couple of other uh, market-moving data, which is causing a little bit of fret amongst investors in London is US inflation figures. Now, that's due out um, tomorrow. Obviously, all eyes are going to be focused on what is going to be taking place and what's being said across the pond. Then, followed by Thursday, the European Central Bank meeting. So, lots of issues are going to be raised. Will we, will we not finally see interest rates coming down? It's all to play for. Um, and that's reflected on the markets at intraday. The all share is up 0.10%. The FTSE 100, the blue chip index, uh, laddie, that's up by 0.06%. And the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's up by 0.11%. In the currencies market, as you were saying, the British pound currently trading up against the US dollar by 0.22%, up to against the euro by 0.17%, and up against the Japanese yen by 0.21%, but still um, nearing those two-week lows, as you were saying, Laddie. All right, all eyes on that US uh, CPI data. That's uh, for March uh, coming out tomorrow. Thank you so much, uh, Julian, for the updates uh, from the UK. Thank you. All right, let's get a sense of what's happening in Europe now. We see mixed news from the German economy. Export in February, that fell more than expected, while industrial production rose for the second month uh, in a row after weak performance in 2023. Well, join us uh, with more as uh, DW correspondent, Chiponda Chimbelu. Um, thanks for joining us, Chip. So what does Germany's latest economic data show? Thanks for having me. Well, Laddie, German exports fell more than expected in February. They were down 2% on the month. Now, that is according to the latest figures from the Federal Statistical Office. That comes after positive export data in January. But the disappointing numbers, um, despite the disappointing numbers, there was a glimmer of hope from the latest slew of economic data, and that was the industrial production figures released on Monday. They show that manufacturing in, G- in Germany continued its upward trend from January. It rose 2.1% on the month. Now, this year's data may point to the end of a phase of weakness, according to the economy ministry. Last year, German manufacturing slumped amid high energy prices and weak demand in other regions. All right, how are the latest uh, figures being read? 
Understandably, the German government is trying to put a positive spin on the latest figures. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz was positive about the latest data, and he also mentioned that inflation is slowing. Now, that is, of course, something that may very well point to a possible interest rate cut by the ECB in June. But industry and businesses are less enthusiastic about the data. The latest export figures show that Germany's trade remains under pressure, according to the president of the German Federal Association of Wholesalers, Dirk Yandura. He said that what is making trade difficult for Germany is its declining competitiveness and an increase in trade barriers around the world. But exporters are looking to the U.S. market with some hope. They believe they will benefit from the upswing there if it continues. And the February numbers show that as well. While shipments to other EU countries fell, as they did to China as well, Germany's exports to the U.S. rose significantly. They increased 10.2% in February. So, of course, a good U.S. economy may very well help offset declines for German exports in the EU and to China. All right, what can we expect from the markets today? Well, today, European stocks are expected to trade lower, laddie. Investors will be taking a breather before the U.S. releases inflation data for March. That will provide an indicator on the timing of an interest rate cut in the United States. And here in Europe, we're likely to get a better sense of when the ECB may cut rates on Thursday. Now, that is when the European Central Bank meets this week. Investors will also be keeping an eye on the ECB lending survey and the U.S. small business sentiment for March. Now, that is data that, of course, will be released today. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Chip, for details uh, in Europe now. All right. Let's get a quick uh, sense of what's happened in other countries. Zimbabwe's new currency, the ZIG, uh, last strengthened the day after its uh, debut. The currency gained about 0.2% at 13, um, 13 per U.S. Um, dollar according to data published on the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe's um, website as today. The ZIG, uh, short for Zimbabwe Gold, uh, was introduced uh, Monday. Zimbabwe's sixth attempt to resuscitate the local currency. Its predecessor, the Zimbabwe dollar, lost value um, every single trading day of this year before being abandoned in April 5th. And the World Bank has forecast that its inflation uh, rates will drop to 24.8% um, year on year in uh, 2024. The development comes after the uh, Nigerian Bureau of Statistics expects the current rate of 31.7% in February from 29.9% recorded uh, in January. The report also reaffirmed this projection of 3.3% economic growth uh, for the country in 2024. All right, to another conversation now. Uh, a report uh, released in March by Detalium, a global talent um, accelerator, uh, said ranked skit making as the third largest entertainment industry in Nigeria, the net worth of over 50 uh, billion naira. Well, joining us now um, to analyze this is Olufemi uh, Guntamo, CEO, lead consultant at Pennsylvania, Africa. Great to have you on the show. Hi, thank you, Ladi. So, since skit making is uh, seen a serious boom right now, is the cost of producing uh, skits still low at this time? Um, I wouldn't say that um, the cost of uh, producing scale is low. I would say that uh, we now have a lot of people who have aspired to become um, skit makers because we've seen a lot of skit makers now be successful. Um, the likes of uh, Brother Shaggy, the likes of Mr. Macaroni, Kiki, and the like, and all of them. So um, we've seen a lot of skit makers now being successful just creating content for digital platforms. And um, they all started with uh, creating content with phone. And um, now it's now becoming like a huge production. So it's not cheap um, and it's not, um, it's not um, a zero cost, right? But now people have seen that with just uh, your phone or just uh, your mobile device, you could, you could be successful, basically, yeah. Right. Uh, um, and sometimes, uh, definitely, even if it's your phone you're using, I'm seeing the prices of phones right now. They're not looking cheap <laughs> <laughs> at this point. But do you think the skit making industry uh, will, will go away anytime soon? 
No, absolutely not. Um, uh, for skit makers now, they're trying to evolve into big screens, uh, trying to evolve into becoming actors um, and blockbuster movies. They're also involved in Netflix movies and adverts and all of that. So um, I don't see skit making as um, an industry that will go into extinction anytime soon, basically. So um, I think that what would just happen is that we'll keep having new set of skit makers and new set of content creators um, in the ecosystem. All right, what's the value chain like? You know, how many uh, people, you know, get employed or, or get work from, you know, one successful skit maker? Okay, great. So once a skit maker gets successful or becomes successful, um, they now tend to enhance their production. So now we have people who are involved in um, the directing of the skit. We have people who are involved even in script writing. Um, and then while on set, you have production assistant, you have production manager, you have makeup and costume and all of that. So skit making now has become like a proper movie production where you have a lot of people behind the scene. So for a, for a skit, um, you can have as much as 10 people behind the scene. So you can see that it's helping uh, job creation, basically. So yeah, about 10 to 15 people behind the scene. And also, do not forget that some of these skit makers now are now becoming big celebrities. So therefore, you also have to put into consideration the security. So even paying security personnel to are part of um, uh, the, the, the crew. Right. And most of these platforms used by skit makers are international. Is it time for Nigeria to start, you know, looking at, you know, having their own social media platform uh, that most of these skit makers can actually produce on? I mean, yeah, possible. Um, I would say that before now, we've always have, we've had um, YouTube platforms, uh, platforms like YouTube, we've had uh, Facebook, we've had um, um, other digital platforms where Skit makers now put their content there to get, I mean, monetized. Um, so yeah, I, absolutely. I think that it's time for Nigeria to have to have a platform, but definitely it has to be monetized. And uh, one of the reasons why skit makers um, run to uh, platforms like YouTube and Facebook is because they get paid FX, right? And then obviously they think that they can earn more uh, via the views and subscribers that they have. So I think that if, if the government can come up with a platform, uh, definitely it would, it would help the economy. Yeah, definitely. We need more FX, you know, coming in. It's quite incredible what some of these uh, YouTubers actually rake in in a month. Quite, quite good numbers. Um, thank you so much. It was great having you. Uh, Ulufemi Oguntamu, CEO, Lead Consultant, Pennsylvania, thank uh, Africa. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Ladi. Uh, let's get a check on other markets now. Uh, talking about the crypto market, we're seeing a mixture, you know, on the screen. There's some green right there, but uh, I'm seeing uh, predominantly red uh, is the color uh, right there in the market. Ethereum is holding up quite well, 0.65%, uh, while Ton, that's uh, deeper in the green uh, this time. Let's look at the sentiments in the market now. Still a greedy market, about 80 points, moving away from the 70-point level, extreme greed. Still a very, very greedy market. Investors still are very bullish in this market, expecting um, the halving and uh, a rally, you know, definitely happening before the halving. Only uh, wondering what's going to happen, you know, when the halving, you know, actually gets here. Let's bring in Alumide Additional now, financial market analyst. Uh, hello, Alumide. Hello, Ladi. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. So um, we're still seeing uh, Bitcoin still uh, at 70,000 uh, at this time, but the, the halving is really, really close. What are you seeing post-halving? Well, I think um, Spot ETF has taken the shine of halving, despite the fact that halving theoretically makes uh, Bitcoin um, scarce. You know, uh, the reward becomes uh, much more difficult. Uh, but it's interesting to say that uh, the rally we've seen in Bitcoin this year has really been from institutional investors. You look at the stash at which Spot ETFs, uh, total accumulation value terms are $10 billion dollars. And you understand the narrative in the crypto market right now. The infusion of capital this year has put the, um, all the important digital asset market value at over 2.3 uh, trillion. And, you know, interestingly, if you look at the chart, you saw Ethereum green. And that was pretty much um, on the reliability pattern of uh, Solana, despite its scalability and interest in NIMI ecosystem. But we've seen downtime in Solana that has triggered buying pressure on more reliable uh, blockchains like Ethereum. So I think um, the market is finding its own feet generally, but it's interesting to say that you cannot ignore uh, the even currency, the US dollar, despite the fact gold is rallying at an all-time high. Rally. Right, right, so many rallies at, at, at this time. But I know you're at the Paris um, Blockchain Week right now. Very quickly, how's it looking right there? What are you talking about? Well, exciting adoption 
for the first time, you know, so excited to be here again. Uh, I'm seeing Quidax, uh, it's a Nigerian-based crypto exchange. You know, over time, uh, anytime I come here, it's always been Western, Asian crypto exchanges taking the space. So the fact seeing Quidax coming on stage and proving um, to investors and customers on what the Nigerian crypto market is, I think um, is a big plus, despite uh, the uh, aggressive approach towards uh, crypto market by the federal government. Yeah, I can imagine. All right, it's always great um, having you, Olumide, and do have fun in Paris. Yeah, thank you, Ladi. All right, so um, that's how markets are, are looking today. It's still a uh, very greedy market, um, talking about the crypto space. Markets here in Nigeria close, so we're going to be waiting till Friday to know uh, what's going to happen in the market. But you can visit channelcv.com for more updates. Uh, I'm Ladi Williams from Media Team, I'm right here at Channels HQ. It's bye for now. Enjoy the holidays.